Hey everyone, and welcome to a special New Year broadcast from the British Association of Anger Management, or BAM for short. My name is Steve Beale. I'm an award-winning journalist who's undertaken the BAM programme, and I'm here with the anger guru, Mike Fisher. Mike's the founder of BAM, which he set up in 1999. He's also the author of Beating Anger, a Times newspaper top 10 self-help book, and he's considered a leading authority in the rapidly growing field of anger management worldwide. Mike, hey, how are you feeling today? Uh, well, I'm slightly headachy, but I'm fairly relaxed and happy. Thanks, Steve. Marvellous. So today we're going to talk about your 15-point guide to reinventing yourself in the new year. So if anyone out there listening is in a new year, new you mindset, we hope to be of some help. Now, these are Mike's personal tips. They don't cover absolutely everything we do here at BAM. And if you do want to find out more about our program, head over to angermanage.co.uk, where you can find tons of resources. So, Mike, maybe first you could tell us a bit about why we might even need to reinvent ourselves. Well, you know, one of the reasons why I thought about doing something at the beginning of the new year is because that's when most people make a decision to reinvent themselves or to commit to making some radical changes in their life in the new year. So considering 2020 has been a very challenging year for most people, and they've had a lot of time to reflect and introspect, I'm hoping they'll make the effort to make 2021 as fabulous as possible. So here in the West, we have so many distractions and encouragements to dedicate energy to things other than our well-being. And all the these are little lessons that, that we can learn that divert attention back to the things that are important for us. And it'll make, it'll help changes in ourselves that we can then take out into the world and bring a, a positive effect to those around us as well. So let's take a look at the list. So these are the 15 points to reinvent yourself for 2021. Number one, Mike, take full responsibility for where you are now. Stop making excuses and blaming others for where you are. Okay, so the reason why I've included that in this uh, list is because so many people that I work with and so many people that I know and so many people in the world are constantly blaming others for the situations that they find themselves in, rather than actually reflecting on their part of why they find themselves in the situations they're in. And that's why I say it's kind of fundamental to be able to take responsibility and hold themselves accountable because it's part of what it means to be an adult and it's also part of the maturation process. It is so easy to bl blame others. It's a lot more difficult to take responsible for who we are and our actions in the world. Things not might be entirely our fault per se. It is our responsibility. Only we can take responsibility for where we are. Yeah, I, I think the, the, the problem is, uh, and I'm just really in reinforcing this, is that, and, and you know, I, I think it's quite important for me to just go back to the client group that I work with, is that it's very difficult for them to see their part in problems that they create for themselves. It's much easier to judge and criticize and make it somebody else's issue. But I think part of the healing process, part of self-regulating, part of reflecting and introspecting, hopefully through that process gets them to the point where they can see their part in it. And then of course, at the point they can see their part in it is make whatever apologies they need to make and then take responsibility for their thoughts, their feelings, their actions and behavior. And is it one of those things that's sort of difficult to confront at first, but once you do, it's a relief? There is something to be said about pushing through one's own shame barrier. Because of course, as I start to reflect and introspect, and start to see my part in the process, I have to get through the guilt and shame. And once I'm able to do that, 
by cutting myself some slack, by recognizing that it's okay to make mistakes, that in itself becomes part and parcel of the process. And of course, part of the healing component. So this isn't a beat yourself up exercise, right? It's, it's a forgive yourself, but realize that only you have the agency to create a new life for yourself moving forward. Well, look, that's certainly what I would recommend is being able to cut oneself some slack, forgive oneself, you know, recognize that you've dropped the ball, made mistakes. And then that's the beauty of, you know, the 1st of January, 2021, is we can reinvent ourselves. I also talk about, you know, being the curator of our own lives. Is let's take charge. Let me take charge of my life and not be at the effect that everything that happens to me in my life. So number two of our 15 point plan for self reinvention is reflect on where you are now and where you want to be in the future. What's getting in the way of you being there? Let me start with talking about reflecting on oneself. You know, there's something really exciting about new beginnings and future choices that we make. And so where I am right now, is that really, really where I want to be? And what changes do I want to make in my life to enhance the quality of my life? And so on that basis, I also have to think about what's working for me in my life and what's not working for me in my life. And then on the basis of that, recognizing what are the obstacles that, that keep me stuck or keep me fixed in a place that I know is unhealthy for me. And, you know, I think of simple examples like, you know, right now in my life, I recognize that I'm overweight. So what's the solution to that? losing weight, eating healthy, but what gets in the way of me doing that? And that's what needs to be investigated. What are the obstacles that get in the way of me doing the things that I know that are healthy for me and also meaningful for me, as well as meaningful and healthy for others? So that's the challenge that we all have. And I include myself in that. So there's something about being practical, making a list, recognizing what, where you are, recognizing what you've achieved. And then of course, recognizing that in 2021, it's a new beginning. And what do, I want to, what do I want to achieve in 2021? And of course, how am I going to get there? And of course, what are the obstacles that get in the way? And are we talking here about things like career, family, living arrangements, practical but important aspects of our lifestyle? Look, I look at it from a slightly different perspective. I break it down into three components, mind, body, and spirit. So with, in the context of mind, you know, being able to investigate our own mental health issues. And as you know, in 2020, because of COVID, a lot of people's mental health issues have increased. That has to be addressed. Body, I talk about being overweight, being underweight, getting physically fit, making sure that you constantly monitor um, what's going on in your body and making sure that you'll regulate wherever you need to regulate. And then in terms of spirit, it's about you know, the things that needle us, the things that wind us up, the things that really affect us on an emotional level, but also on a spiritual level. And you know, you and I've already had this conversation. I don't quite know what spiritual means. The closest I can get to spiritual in my life is the relationships that I have with others. So looking at the relationships that I have with others, how can I enhance those relationships? How can I recognize what is healthy in those relationships? What's unhealthy in, the, in those relationships? Where do I need to work harder in those relationships? So for me, I break it out into mind, body, and spirit dash relationships. So point three here is think about what you want to be and why, and why is that so important to you? How does that differ from, from point number two? Is this more about the person that you see yourself as or the person that you, you that you want to be in terms of mindset and emotions? I see it in terms of mindsets and emotions. So I, I, I look at it within the context of my relationships. 
And not only in the context of my relationships with others, but of course, within the context of my relationship with myself. Ah. So really at the end of the day, how can I be a better person than I already am? You know, what do I need to do in order to enhance or increase my self-esteem and increase the nature of my relationships with others? And, you know, this is a conversation I had with somebody recently around connections. It's all about connections. I remember listening to Deepak Chopra. Uh, In fact, I went to a, a talk of his and he says, you know, we're all about connections. You know that beautiful saying about the butterfly flaps its wings in China and it causes a hurricane in America. We're all connected. Now, I don't want to get into the kind of esoterics of it, but there is something about intimacy and connection. And what I think is most important of all is the relationship that I have with myself and the relationship that I have with others. I mean, right now I see so many people so darn lonely on this planet. It's heartbreaking. Consider of how many there are on this planet. You know, we're billions of people. And yet so many people suffer from loneliness. And of course, loneliness will also create depression. So it's about looking inwards and seeing how I can better myself, how I can be a better person, how I can be the best version of myself, 724. Now, I'm not saying we have to be neurotic about that, but I do think there's something to be said about how can I better myself? How can I contribute to my culture, to my society, to the global village? And so as I start exploring that, and that's not just a conversation I have with myself, maybe that's a conversation I have with people that I love and care for. And I ask them and I say to them, what kind of changes would you like to see in my life? And this is a conversation I've already had with my girlfriend. Okay, I recognize that you want me to change certain qualities. Tell me what they are and I'll do my very best to do that. Because getting the feedback from others is just gonna enhance us enhance our own status as we reflect on who we are in the world. And then I can ask the other person, you know, I'd like to suggest some changes that I think that might be useful for you to make without trying to patronize you. And if the person agrees with that, of course, we can then have that conversation. But I do think it's very important for us in 2021 to self-reflect, self-respect, self-love, and to work at being the best version of ourselves without being too attached to the fact that we could potentially fail at the starting point. And this is something that might not come overnight. It might be something that takes inverted commas work as in, you know, consistent, gradual application. You know, Steve, uh, 30 years ago, 40 years ago, it might not have been possible in the way that so much is accessible today. Today, there's no excuse to not grow. And when I say grow, I'm talking about emotionally, psychologically, physically. I mean, we have so many resources available to us today. There's simply no excuse. I often tell the story, by the way, about, you know, if you're living in California or in New York and you tell somebody that you don't have a therapist, they think something's wrong with you. Whereas 30 years ago, if you told somebody you had a therapist, you know, they would think there's something wrong with you. So having therapists, reading the books, participating in the weekend workshops, uh, participating in therapy groups and mixed groups, et cetera, in order to enhance the quality of your emotional well-being and your emotional life, you know, it's a no-brainer today. There's no excuse not to do that. So point number four here is make a bucket list of things you want to do just for yourself and keep them close by so you can remind yourself daily. So is this more of a sort of self-care thing or a goals thing or both? Well, I see it as a a nourishing thing. So it would probably include both. Um, What I've been doing over the last couple of days, in fact, the last week is doing exactly what we're talking about. And I've been thinking about, okay, well, what are the things I wanted to do in 2020 that I couldn't do because of COVID? And, you know, you and I have already had conversations about I wanted to hang out in Ibiza for a couple of months. Uh, And and I know that's something that you want to do as well. And because of COVID, we both couldn't do that. However, um, I was thinking about, okay, so in terms of a practical 
bucket list. You know, what are the things that I would have loved to have done in 2020 that I know that I can potentially do in 2021 based on the fact that I get my vaccine before the end of this month? And when I say end of this month, I'm talking about the end of January. And I thought about, okay, well, what have I been spe speaking about? One is I want to continue learning how to sail. Two is I definitely want to spend more time traveling. I'd like to go to Japan. I'd like to go back to Costa Rica. I'd love to do ayahuasca ceremony at some point. I'd like to increase my experience and, and practice as a ceramic artist. And so, you know, I've already made a list of things that I want to do for 2021. Those are the practical things. What are the health things? Well, I want to start getting fit. And of course, the question is what gets in the way of me or what stops me from doing that? What are the obstacles that I'm creating? I want to lose weight. I want to do, I, I certainly want to enhance the nature of my academic studies in the field of personal and professional development. And I want to train in the field of internal family systems and possibly another training, which might be the Gottman method. So I think there's two parts to this. It's about enhancing the quality of our outer world as well as enhancing the quality of our inner world. And by the way, when I talk about keeping those, um, that it, the bucket list close by, that's exactly what I've done. So I've written it down. And as I achieve what I want to achieve, I can then tick it off. But I'm actually very, very excited about 2021 because I've had enough time to reflect on what I want to do. And I think there is something fantastic about COVID because it means that, you know, we've taken so much for granted. The freedoms that we once had and the opportunities that we once had by not taking those opportunities COVID has reminded us is that actually we do have the freedom to do the things that we want to do, however big or how small. Let's go out and do them once we've been vaccinated, once you know the, 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 the pandemic is over and we are much safer venturing afar. So, I mean, the, this talk about lists of goals has been useful for me because I sit down to do it and I can't really get any further with my goals than I would like to survive until this time next month. And I don't just mean survive COVID, I mean survive business, everything like that. So this has been useful because the, the bucket list doesn't have to say, I would like to fly on Virgin Galactic. It can be, I would like to make some time just to sit down and watch that one hour YouTube lecture that I've been really wanting to see. Yeah. Right. <clears throat> so it's about self-care, self-determination, and j j just, just making sure that we keep track of, of doing things for ourselves. Yeah, and then taking them off as we've achieved the result that we want to achieve. So number five, though, is an interesting point on that front, which is embrace the process of getting there and enjoy it. The journey is more interesting than the end result. Why I included that is because I think so many of us focus on the end result, um, you know, achieving the result, ticking the box, and then, of course, moving on. But I do think there's something about saturating ourselves in the experience. And you know, I, the, the closest I can get to that is on many of the anger management programs that I deliver on, what often happens is that we start getting into, we go off track, yeah, not staying on track. And it's fascinating when we kind of um, change the conversation and expand the conversation to something completely different for some people who are terribly, terribly impatient, they want to get back on track. But the truth is we're on track because we're talking about things that are meaningful, not just for the individual, but for the collective. So from where I'm sitting, I'm the kind of guy who is terribly impatient and I want it and I want it now. So I completely forget about the actual journey being what's most rich and most exciting. All I'm interested is in the end goal which means in many ways that I'm not present to what it is that I'm experiencing, what I'm encountering, what I'm feeling, what I'm understanding, what I'm making sense of. Um, and I'm not suggesting, you know, every Dick, Tom and Harry out in the world um, is, is, is doing that. But I know that with myself, you know, part of my problem has been that I 
focus on the end goal rather than the journey itself. And, you know, if you look at it from a philosophical perspective, it's always been in reinforced to stay focused on the journey. And whatever the end result is, is the end result. Yes, interesting. So, I mean, in terms of my own experience of embracing the process, 10 years ago, I said to myself, right, I'm going to own a house, I'm going to get married, and I'm going to have my own business. <clears throat> Varying degrees of success on those three, certainly all of them, the goals were attained. Was the result what I expected? Not necessarily. But the journey it is the thing I take away as the reward rather than the end result. Point six of our reinvention guide for 2021. Throw out your old wardrobe and buy yourself some new clothes that reflect who you want to be. So this sounds like a sort of practical exercise, a gesture, a ritual almost. And it works? Listen, I'm, I'm you know, I... I'm quite embarrassed by this, but um, I, I read an article once which said, if you haven't worn any of your clothes for the last six months, send them to a charity shop because you're not going to be wearing them again. So, you know, I'm the kind of guy is I'll buy this beautiful shirt because it's a beautiful shirt, but I know that I'm just a bit too fat for it. So I keep it there, hoping that one day I'll lose the weight. So anyway, I... I I did just that. I actually ruthlessly, ruthlessly went through my wardrobe and I started to collect shirts, shorts, jeans, shoes, t-shirts, etc. And there was something quite amazing about putting them in a black bag and dropping them off at the local charity shop. One was that they were grateful for it. Two, it felt like, well, in fact, I did feel lighter because, you know, there's a part of me when I go to my wardrobe and I see this beautiful shirt and I, I want to wear it and I can't wear it because I'm still reminded of that I'm still overweight. Of course, it's a real drag and it's a real problem. And so there's something about, and I think you said it, it is a, it is a ritualistic act. It is about you know, getting rid of the old and starting with the new. So not only is it practical, but it's also symbolic. And that's what I think you mean and I mean by ritual. Yeah. And, mm -hmm. um, and, and because, you know, we're moving into 2021, uh, I think any kind of symbolic act or ritual is really a, a reflection and is significant of the new and wel welcoming and embracing and preparing ourselves for the new. So, you know, I think about recently, a client was talking to me about, you know, he realizes that he just hasn't kept up with fashion trends. And I said to him, well, you know, why don't you just get rid of your clothes and go out and buy yourself a new wardrobe? And it was quite interesting because he, he, he looked at me, he said, but, but, I, but I love, I love what I wear. It's so comfortable. Yes, I know that. But actually, wouldn't it be nice to indulge yourself in something new and something different? Well, one, it boosts the economy. And second of all, you know, those old clothes you can give to charity because they'll, you know, go to locals or hopefully they'll even be shipped to Africa where people are desperate for clothes. So there's something really, something very gratifying and um, um, what is the word? So there's something that's really gratifying and also there's something liberating in being able to do that. And it's a small gesture, but it can make such a big difference. And I've seen the way I've done it and it's really worked for me. And, and by the way, I've thrown out or given bags and bags and bags of clothes to charity shops that I haven't worn for 10, 12, 15, 20 years. Well, they're probably back in fashion again now in my... Well, they, 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 they probably are. So it's a, bit, it's a bit like the old um, dress for the job that you want rather than the job that you have. Yes, yes. So and, I, you know, it's such, a, it's such a small gesture, Steve, but I think it's quite a life-enhancing gesture, trying on a new shirt or a new jacket or a new pair of jeans. You know, just even if it's going to give you a physical boost for maybe the next uh, two, three, four days, well, why not? 
Mike, you don't have to tell me. I used to be the fashion director of FHM magazine. Clothes are architecture for the soul. Now, number 7.7 7 here. Get on and do something that you always thought you would not. Now, is this an exercise in sort of breaking a, a psychological barrier, a psychological blockage? I am not the same person I was five or 10 years ago. I'm a very different person because I'm one of those individuals, I'm constantly reinventing myself. And, and this is okay, right? Because we, we look at politicians, for example, and we say, well, you said something different 20 years ago. So why, you know, why should I believe in, the, in your convictions now? Well, you know, one of the beautiful things about being human is we can change our mind and start again. You know, I might have thought this yesterday, but actually with a little bit of introspection, reflection and consideration, you know, I have a different viewpoint today. You know, we can change our minds. And that's what's so beautiful about being human. As I was saying earlier on, is that there is something to be said, you know, the person I was five years ago is not the person I am today. You know, five years ago, when I thought about doing a skipper's course, in sailing, it was just like, oh my God, you know what? I just don't have the time for that. But five years later, well, actually, you know, thinking about it, why don't I just create the time? And, you know, most of those trainings and courses can be done online today. Whereas on five years ago, I couldn't find any of those courses online. So it is about going back in time, reflecting of something that you would have loved to have done or the many things that you had loved to have done that maybe you can do now and of course, maybe you've got more time and you're more financially secure to do the things that you wanted to do then and do them now. You know, another example I like to give is like, I've been wanting to weld for years, absolutely weld for years. So I thought, okay, well, what do I do? So I went on YouTube and I looked at a couple of um, videos on welding. And then I thought, okay, this doesn't sound too difficult. One is the technology today. The equipment today is cheaper uh, and is simpler to use. So I'm thinking, okay, well, why don't I just buy the technology and play around with it? You know, the technology today is not expensive at all. It's simple and it's uncomplicated. But five years ago, it was like, okay, well, where do I even begin? So it's a reframe of my mindset in order to transform my life and create a better quality life for myself. So it sounds like it's a fantastic exercise, again, in demonstrating that change is possible, and also with putting us back in touch with ourselves. Look, I, I, absolutely, Steve. And I, you know, I also look at it, look at it from the perspective of just getting out of our own way. You know, if I say to myself, I can't do something, I create the obstacle. If I had to say to myself, well, I'd like to do it, but maybe now's not the time. I can do it in the future. That in itself is transformative because I've planted the seed. And sometimes I think, I mean, if I go back to, you know, skip getting my, my, my skipper's license, you know, I created obstacles for myself. Today, I look in, today I'm looking at it with very fresh eyes and saying, God, you know, Mike, you can do that whenever you want. But because I want to get into sailing and I want to make sailing part of my lifestyle, well, make it a priority and get on with it. If it's going to nourish me and nurture me and increase my happiness, why not do it? And so really what I'm talking about is getting out of the rut that we create for ourselves and actually jumping the curve by looking at it and reframing it and looking at it more positively. So point number eight in our 2021 reinvention guide, start chatting to strangers and people you would usually ignore. I once returned from holidaying in the American South where I got very used to striking up conversations with everyone. <laughs> And when I came back to London, it didn't go down so well. Is there, how, how does one do this? Is, maybe there's a difference between chatting to people and impressing your personality on them. Well, look, you know, this is, this is fascinating. As, as you already know, Steve, I've, I've, I've traveled all over the world and I love traveling. It's, it's, you know, it's, traveling is part of my therapy. And... Um, it's, it's quite an interesting what you're saying, because there is something about like when I come back to London, all of a sudden I start to socially shut down. And I think that I do myself a disservice when I, when I do that. Now, I'm not talking about, well, I'm not suggesting you know, sitting on the overground or the underground and having a long conversation with a, of a stranger. But I do think there's something about making more of an effort to whether I go into a shop 
or whether I'm going to a supermarket and starting to engage people. When I go to a gallery and somebody's standing at a painting, you say, well, what do you think of this painting? You know, I know in London, you, you, you speak to strangers and they think you're completely nuts, but there's something to be said about taking the risk because I think people live such interesting lives. And if they are responsive to being spoken to, you know, you get a really interesting conversation out of them. I know when I go back to South Africa, I can speak to anybody at any point at any time and greet people very comfortably. But a city like London, because of the nature of London being London, it's about breaking these particular mindsets. And I know when I go to New York, you know, as soon as they hear my accent, the first thing a New Yorker wants to do is, hi, how are you doing? Where are you from? I love the accent. You know, they're, they're very spontaneous. And so there's something to be said about being more spontaneous about who we are in the world, right. being less self-conscious, not being bothered or too worried about what other people think of us. Because if you have an interaction with a stranger, all it is is an inter interaction. But of course, something can be developed out of that. But within the British culture, we are really, really reserved. You know, I often talk about this in my programs is that sometimes I feel like I'm pulling teeth and I don't want to do that. And so there is something about the culture that limits us in being able to interact. Now, I know in the, in the, the town that I uh, have our headquarters in, East Grinstead, people are warm and friendly. You know, when I get onto the street, I can basically have a conversation with anybody. So there's something about London where we have to break the cycle of every time somebody actually speaks to you, you think they're completely a crazy person. None of that's true. None of that's true at all. So it's about taking risks and being less invent invested in what other people think of you. And the more spontaneous, the healthier it is for you. Point number nine in our reinvention guide is take up at least three new hobbies. Now, hobbies have been sort of tremendously unfashionable, haven't they, for about for a long time. And I blame Stevie Wonder and his record Pastime Paradise where he suggested that hobbies were merely distractions from the real world. And but, but maybe there's an element of truth in that, that, that some of us uh, get, get a bit too lost in our compulsions or obs and obsessions. But why, um, why can hobbies be good for our mental health, Mike? Well, not only are they good for our mental health, but they're also good for our self-esteem. And also it's about connecting. And, you know, I was thinking about, for example, I've just watched The Queen's Gambit um, and how many more chessboards have been sold international because internationally because people have been watching The Queen's Gambit. I love chess, but I haven't played chess in years. So I'm thinking, oh my God, maybe I need to go back to playing chess. Now, you don't have to play with another person. You can play against a computer. Of course, I'm going to suggest play against a person. But you know, there's been a boost, there's been a spike in people buying books on chess, reading, uh, reading the books, playing the games with, them, with, their, with themselves or with, uh, with a partner, or of course, uh, against a computer. Um, I think about the, um, what was it called? The throwdown, the ceramics and pottery um, program, which was competitive where they got all these ceramic artists and potters together and doing a throwdown. All of a sudden there was kind of this massive boost in people wanting to do ceramics and wanting to do pottery. So there's something to be said about um, how as a, as a culture, we are so influenced by the kind of opportunities to bake, to cook, to do ceramics, to play chess, to surf or whatever it is. But a lot of these games and a lot of these activities are community-based. And I would often encourage people to do community-based hobbies. So you're out and about and you can interact with others. There are a lot of lonely, isolated hobbies that, can, that one can take up. But even, you know, I think about gardening. You don't have to do gardening alone. You can do gardening with a family member. Or, you know, if you want to do, I don't know, wood turning, for example. You know, you can do that alone, but you can also do courses on wood turning, becoming a better wood turner. So there's something about it not only enhancing the quality of our lives, but it also is a new experience. And I think we are, as a culture, we like new experiences because they inspire us, they excite us, 
And of course, they add a different quality to our lives. I know so many people who've worked their own their whole lives without a single hobby. So they get to the point of retiring. They don't know what to do with themselves because all they've ever done is work. You know, I'm one of those fortunate individuals because I'm a, I'm a creative. So, you know, I'm constantly learning new things. So at the moment I'm doing um, bronze casting. I'm working in res, excuse me, I'm working in resin and I'm working in wood. And it's absolutely inspirational. And what I did say at the beginning, if it's going to boost my self-esteem, why not do it? But find something that is meaningful, that doesn't necessarily have to be expensive, but, you know, get your teeth into it. So I always encourage three new hobbies. I think we're, we're so used to working and recovering from work. Yes. Whether that means inverted commas, chilling out, or whether it means self-medicating. Yes. And I think we always think, oh, oh, we haven't got the time. And maybe that's why what, with COVID and people having a bit more time at home, there's been a hobby revival. Yes. Look, you know, there's another dimension to this, Steve. You know, if you think about gaming and kids, think about how many hobbies you probably had as a kid. I had loads of hobbies as a kid. I've always had hobbies. But just think about how many kids out in the world today the only hobby is what? Gaming? Is that Gaming, it? yeah. Social media. Yes. Those, those aren't hobbies. Those are an escape from reality. So, you know, it's about finding hobbies, whether it's, you know, joining a scouts club or whether it's joining a backgammon club or whether it's joining an art class. I mean, I don't know what it is because each individual has their own, you know, interests, but they need to make an effort and it'll make... 2021, a hell of a lot richer. So point 10 in our reinvention guide is learn to trust who you are in the world. And as you do so, watch your world unfold. Now, often people who come to the British Association of Anger Management are angry because they haven't connected with themselves enough and they allow themselves to be sort of led by external forces whether that's sort of uh, other people or a preconditioned idea of what, what they have to do to be inverted commas, successful or fulfilled. Uh, how do we begin to, to get a bit more in touch with who we are in the world and trusting our, our instincts there? Look, the way I look at it, Steve, is that there are people who are risk friendly and there are people who are risk averse. And the way I look at it is that people who are risk averse tend to trust themselves less. There's a paradox there because a lot of people who uh, don't trust themselves, they tend to trust others more than they trust themselves. And so from my perspective, the more you're able to trust yourself, the more risks you take. And the more risks you take could potentially work to your own advantage. Now, Within the context of our anger management programs, uh, we do a process called shaking the apple tree, which is directly linked to stress. And stress, of course, as you know, is directly linked to anxiety and fear. So the more stressed we are, the more angry we become, or the more stressed we are, the more depressed we become. And of course, it just fuels mental health issues in the world today. And so I look at it from the point of view that as we start to trust ourselves more, it means that we'll take more risks. And I'm not necessarily suggesting calculated risks, but just take more risks and see what happens. Because at the end of the day, worst case scenarios, you could end up dead. And when you're dead, what's the problem? You're dead. So there's something to be said about, as I learn to trust myself, and when I say I trust myself, I'm talking about trusting myself fully in the world. It does a couple of things for me. It enhances the quality of my life. It enhances my self-esteem. It increases my confidence. And actually, I'll end up being much happier. But in our programs, we actually look at how to do that. And, you know, I could talk about it now, but I'm also very aware about time. But I do think there's something to be said about as we learn how to trust who we are in the world, it enhances the quality of our lives. So feel the fear. Do it anyway. And even if it doesn't work out, at least you've gained some strength and confidence. Yeah, and more understanding of yourself. Absolutely, thank you. So point 11 here in our reinvention guide 
is stop sweating the small stuff. Make a list of the small stuff that drains your energy. And as you break the pattern, tick it off. Easier said than done. And I'm sure there's a quote here from Dr. Johnson that I can't quite remember about how it's the small stuff that's actually harder to deal with sometimes. Steve, I think the problem is that people don't ever make a list of the small stuff. You know, earlier on, I was talking about change, you know, asking our loved ones about what do they think that we need to change in our lives and vice versa. There's something about being able to make a list of the small stuff, you know, the things that really do irritate me, and yet they take up so much of my energy. Uh, and unless I give it attention, full attention and intention, things just don't change. And so my encouragement and my suggestion is see if you can identify a minimum of 10 things that irritate you. And that's what I mean by sweating the small stuff and turning the small stuff into these major, major dramas. So once I'm able to make a list of the things that irritate me, so for example, one of the things that irritate me is people jumping the queue, uh, jumping queues. The simple thing is that. I mean, what's the problem? So if somebody jumps the queue, they jump the queue. You know. Don't go to Switzerland. Yeah. I mean, Israel do it all the time. In Israel, people, there's no such thing as a queue in is Israel. Yeah. And so that, that would be an example of the small stuff. The other thing is incompetent people. You know, I become very judgment of people incompetent. What's the big deal? They don't experience themselves as incompetent. I experience them as incompetent. They don't see themselves as incompetent at all. And yet I'm putting in energy and investing energy and time in sweating the small stuff. And of course, as I said, it drains my energy. So I, I list the things that really trigger me and I make a conscious decision, a very conscious decision for them not to trigger me. So the next, the next time that I get triggered being in a queue, I can then remind myself, hey, Mike, you made a commitment to yourself not to sweat the small stuff. And all I'm doing here, Steve, is I'm just suggesting how we, we, re, we raise this to our awareness. With the awareness, we can act on awareness. But if we don't raise our own awareness to some of the issues that we have going on in our lives, however big or however small, nothing ever gets done. Now, for point 12, you've put take life less seriously but put more into life. That sounds like a hard balance. What, what, what have you learned yourself putting this into practice that might help? Well, look, I, I, I didn't come up with that particular quote, but when I read it, I thought, wow, isn't that interesting? Take life less seriously, but put more into life. What an interesting quote that was. So what I did is I thought about, okay, well, where do I take life very serious? And keeping in mind, you know, being a therapist, life is serious. So when I start to recognize the areas in my life that I take too seriously, even being a you know, practitioner of this work, sometimes I've got to realize that it's not that serious. Uh, it might be serious in the moment, but maybe next week it's not serious. But it means that by putting so much energy into being serious, and when I say serious, I'm talking about really serious, being concerned about myself, concerned about my future, concerned about other people's selves and their futures and their mental health, et cetera, et cetera. Um, it's quite draining. And so as I, if I can just use that word again, you know, stop sweating the small stuff and start to recognize that there's certain qualities and certain areas in my life, I simply don't have to take that serious. You know, I think about Brexit, for example, you know, Stephen, I can't tell you the amount of energy I've put into Brexit over the last, what, five years. Thank God it's over. But of course, it's going to come up with new issues. We know that. But I took it very seriously. I took Trump very seriously. I mean, I don't need to do that. When I say seriously, I put a lot of energy into these issues. But they come and go. And so what I mean by... Um, taking life less seriously, but being put more into life, putting more into life means that I have more energy to being spontaneous, to being creative, to, to, to enjoying myself more. Why am I worrying about people like Trump? Why am I worrying about things like Brexit? Why, Why do we find it so easy to worry about things like political slash ideological 
arguments rather than our own well-being or our family's well-being. Well, you know, Stephen, the only way I can describe this for myself, it, it's a distraction. It's a distraction. That's what it is. And, and I have to find a way of not distracting myself to the things that are really, truly meaningful. So it's like a sort of a dopamine hit. Yeah, I think it's a little bit more than a dopamine hit. I think it's right. a dopamine hit, and I think it's an adrenaline rush and a distraction. Right, right. And maybe I need to put my time and energy into, you know, into conservation, animal conservation, or ecology. And because those are the real issues that are not going to go away until we actually address them. Yeah, I mean, I agree. It's hard to have a convert. It's hard, though, isn't it? When when you're in a room full of well, when you're in a room full of people and everyone wants to talk about Brexit and you want to talk about <laughs> you want to talk about yoga, it's 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 difficult, isn't it? Because it, you almost feel like the sort of odd one out because you don't want to talk about Brexit or <laughs> Trump. Absolutely. You know, it's, it's interesting because you and I have had conversations where we, we, we recently we've spoken about Brexit. And, and as you know, I spent a lot more time in Spain. It's just like energetically, I just I just don't have the energy for it. You know, I've got more important, more, more important things going on in my life. But yet, when I think of how much energy it's taken away from me over the last four years, it's ridiculous. Absolutely ridiculous. Well, and I've got to the point where I'm judgmental about it. And I think... Well, if you've got the energy to worry about Brexit and Trump, then you're obviously not worried about your finances or your marriage. Or <laughs> Absolutely. I mean, think about COVID. You know, I'm obsessed with COVID. And I, I'm obsessed. It's an obsession. Because the last thing I want to do is I, want to, I don't want to get ill. And I think people are acting incredibly, incredibly irresponsibly at this point. And we can see that in the spikes. And yet I put a lot of energy into it. Why do I put so much energy into it? It's another distraction from what might be more meaningful to me than you know, worrying about the things that I really don't have a lot of control over. In fact, that I have no control over. So talking of which, point 13 says, simplify your life one day at a time and you'll find yourself feeling so much happier. So I think this is a tenet of Raja Yoga which is the philosophy behind what we know as yoga, which is the stretching exercises, which is the, the basic bit of Raja Yoga. Where, and one of the early points of discipline in Raja Yoga is to simplify your life. Idea being so you can then live a spiritual life less burdened by overcommitment. And I find often the people who find their way to the British Association of Anger Management, or what you could call overachievers. And often they've overcommitted, sometimes, you know, to gain inner fulfillment, other times to please the people around them, satisfy their conditioning, but they take too much on and it all blows back on them. And they get confused because all they're trying to do is fit everyone in and keep everyone happy, but nobody seems happy. Is this because they could do with simplifying their life? And how, how does someone what, with a busy job and kids and a marriage, how do they simplify their life? I, I, I want to come to it. I'll, I'll answer that question. I want to come to it in a, in a slightly different way. I mean, there's a point that you're making, which I think is very valid. You know, there's a lot of people I work with are overachievers and low self-esteemers. Um, but you you introduced me to the rational male, the work of Tomasi. And um, as a point of interest, Mike, as a point of interest, <laughs> as a point of interest. But I, I I remember reading a section of his book where he talks about the more plates that you're spinning, the more choices that you have. And I I don't know whether that's true because one has to see it within the context of you know our everyday living. And a lot of people I work with are spinning, you know, not five or 10 or 15 or 20 plates. They're spinning, they're spinning hundreds of plates and their lives are not just complicated, but they've overcomplicated their lives. Um, we, we could talk about why they've overcomplicated their lives, which from my perspective has to do with, it's a just distraction from the things that are truly important. And of course it becomes an addiction and the addiction is to the drama. And, you know, there are different types of addiction, but I think 
the addiction to drama, you know, this, this term drama queens is not just valid for women, but also valid for men. So what I'm talking about, Steve, is that, you know, a lot of people I work with, they not only spinning five or 10 or 15 or 20 plates, they split, they're spinning hundreds of plates and they, they are, as far as I'm concerned, they are drama queens. They're ad adrenaline junkies. They're drama junkies. And it's a very effective way of distracting themselves from the things that are truly important to them, truly meaningful for them. And so what I encourage is that we need to identify what plates we don't have to spin any longer. Where can we start cutting out some of the dramas that we've created for ourselves and actually recognize ultimately they don't serve us. And so it's about being able to simplify the amount of plates that we actually spin. And that's why I talk about keeping our lives as simple as and as uncomplicated as possible. And so if I just had to go in, into it slightly deeper, we ultimately know what works for us. We ultimately know what's healthy for us. And we also ultimately know what is unhealthy for us. It's a very easy way to identify it. It's based on physical and emotional discomfort or pain. So example I can give you, say um, I am having a challenging relationship with one of my siblings. And yet all I want them to do is to love me and their capacity to love me is not possible. So I have to think, do I want to put more energy into that? Do I want to turn it into a drama? That's one of the, the plates that I'm spinning. Well, then I have a choice once I'm aware of that to say, well, actually, you know what? I don't want to put as much energy into them as I usually do. It's a choice that I make. I know it's healthier for me. That's one example. Another example could look something like, okay, I'm working 18, 19, 20 hours a day. Ultimately, is that serving me? Is that giving me fulfillment? Is that giving me happiness? Well, no, it's not exactly. So how can I go from 20 hours a day to 15 hours a day? So really thematically, what am I talking about in all of these conversations that you and I are having is how can we begin the process of being a lot more reflective, a lot more introspective, slowing it all down, giving ourselves time and space to think about what is healthy, what is unhealthy, what is meaningful and what is unmeaningful. And as we simplify our lives and stop sweating the small stuff, things will just change and they change naturally. And I know in my own life, I've had to train myself to simplify it because of the nature of what it is that I do. And because of that, I know that I'm more relaxed and I'm a hell of a lot happier. But for me, it's still work in progress. Now, number 14 is get present, live in the moment. Stop futurizing and catastrophizing. Remove the chatter in your head that starts with what if. Now, very difficult. Mark Twain, the author, said, I've lived through some terrible things in my life, some of which actually happened. So this is, we can get terribly worried, can't we, about the meeting next week or that the, the, you know, the event that could go either way that, that's going to happen in the future. And often the worrying is worse than the actual event and the anticipation of said events. And, you know, to, to say people are suffering from a certain amount of, of trauma, then, it, you know, that this can be wildly out of, proportion can't it yes so so what can people do you know certainly in terms of maybe some first aid if, if people are waking up super nervous about what's going to happen in 2021 look steve um as you already know um mindfulness practice meditation yoga martial arts tai chi chi kung anything that is going to help us to get present in our, in our lives. Now, what, what I find really interesting is that when I've said to people, um, you know, my suggestion is that you have to get present in your life. They've actually said to me things like, what do you mean by that? 
what do you mean by being present? I don't know. I don't know what you mean by that, which is indication of how unpresent they are. So, for example, you know, people who overthink, who ruminate, who catastrophize, who futurize, they're not present. And actually, if we slow our lives down, if we simplify our lives, if we start a practice which means that we can get more present, that in itself becomes profoundly transformative to do all the other 13 things we've already spoken about. Um, many of us, as you probably already know, are addicted to drama, addicted to catastrophes, are looking out for them, they're expecting them, so they're on high alert. And unfortunately, being on high alert means that you're not present because you're anticipating some kind of curveball or some kind of dramatic or traumatic event about to happen or potentially about to happen. I so, know people who, are, they, this is how they fuel themselves. Yes. But, so, and, and that they see it as, um, and I'm not, I'm not criticizing them for one minute, but they see it as a rule for life to be constantly nervous, constantly anticipating the worst. And that's the only way they're going to protect themselves. But what are they that. protecting themselves from is the question that you have to ask yourself. More pain, more fear, more terror, more disaster. And as long as we keep doing that, the idea of really enjoying the here and now, the present moment becomes more and more and more difficult. And of course, what you're really describing there, Steve, is people who are overstimulated, who are mentally overstimulated. That's why I often encourage mindfulness practices, meditation, martial arts, getting back into their bodies, getting back into the here and now through those kinds of practices. And it's not like those practices don't exist. Those practices do exist. So it might be that part of what we have to do is make a commitment to ourselves to get more present in our lives. Now, I like the work of Eckhart Tolle. He wrote a book called The Power of Now. I'm, I'm, I'm sure you or uh, most of the listeners know the book. But Eckhart Tolle says something really interesting. He says, um, how do you know when you are present? And his response to that is, you know when you're present, when you ask yourself, are you present? And I really, really like that. Um, that's the one way of looking at it. But another way of looking at it, and, and this is a, a technique that I use because I think that's the important piece here, which is that when I actually wake up in the morning, I do a practice. When I go to bed in the evening, I do a practice. And if I forget to do the practice, I'll probably wake up at some point in the middle of the night to do the practice. And the practice is gratitude, appreciating what I have. So you know, give an example of that is, and this is all about being present in my life. It's bringing awareness to the situation I'm in right now. So maybe the appreciation, my practice in the morning is appreciating that I've had a, I've been warm. I've had a great night's rest. I've got something to look forward to during the day and that actually I'm fit and healthy. That could maybe be my morning practice. My evening practice before going to sleep is to appreciate all the things I've done today, all the connections I've made, all the events that I've experienced or created. And so that is part and parcel of getting more present in my own life. And of course, I always, always encourage people to do mindfulness practices. There are podcasts, there's loads and loads of guided visualizations on YouTube. There's books on the subject and there's loads and loads of workshops and group workshops that you can attend in order to do just that. And something like considering what you're grateful for every day, that that's another gradual cumulative process that we should remember that we get the benefits from when we do it regularly, but we shouldn't turn it into a chore that we beat ourselves up about, right? Well, look, historically I did, because I made a point of if I didn't remember to do it in the morning and the evening, um, I, I, I would feel rather guilty. But keeping in mind, for me, it was I, I wanted to use that practice to really not only appreciate what it is that I have, but also to bring me fully into the present. 
And um, there is something else within the context of the science of the gratitude prayer, because that's what oh. it's called, is that it suggests that if you do that practice every day, in the morning and in the evening, within the first three months, you will increase your happiness quotient. So if you're doing the gratitude prayer and you are doing um, the simplifying your own life by getting present, actually that'll increase your happiness quotient. And if that is something really simple to do without it costing you a penny, why not do it? It's just simply a practice, which is not very complicated and easy enough to do. Problem is we've got to remember doing it. So the last point, number 15, in our January 2021 reinvention guide is remind yourself that every day is a new beginning. You know what? I love that. Um, one of the things that I've done in my relationship with my girlfriend, Marina, is that, you know, say, for example, we've had a challenging day. It might have been a challenging day with each other or just simply a challenging day. One of the things we keep reminding ourselves is tomorrow is another day tomorrow is a new beginning. I actually take inspiration from that because, you know, the next day or the following day, I can choose how I want to shape that day according to my needs and my wants and my desires. So there's something really, really exciting being able to say to myself, um, okay, tomorrow's another day and how are you going to use that day to make the quality of my life more inspirational, more meaningful, and more nourishing. So, you know, under the circumstances, I think there's something quite transformative about being human is because we can reinvent ourselves. We can draw a line in the sand and say, okay, I want my life to be different tomorrow, but how am I going to do that in order to achieve that? So this is empowering. It's, it's not comforting. It's empowering and it's transformative. Transformative. That's what we're hoping our 15 point plan will do for all you listeners in 2021. Uh, that was Mike Fisher, the anger gurus, 15 point self reinvention plan. If you enjoyed listening, got something out of it, then may we recommend our wisdom track podcast, which you can find on our website and YouTube channels or search for the wisdom track podcast. And we've got a ton of other practical anger management and well-being resources on our website angermanage.co.uk as well you can of course follow us on social media search for the british association of anger management on facebook or anger management uk on instagram follow the 15 point plan we're sure you'll find some work better for you than others and that's fine Let's all work hard at having a calm and collected 2021, everybody. Thank you, Mike, and thanks everybody for listening.